Welcome everyone to the webinar Engaging with STEM During COVID. My name is Denise Lewis and I'm the Vice Chair of STEM Link. Today we have three esteemed panelists who are presenting on their programmatic efforts during COVID. First up, we have Megan Carlton. Megan is a science librarian and assistant professor at UNC Greensboro, where she assists students and faculty with research in STEM fields. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Animal Science from Middle Tennessee University and a Master's Degree in Library and information science from the University of Tennessee. Megan's current research interests include implementing citizen science projects in undergraduate education and exploration of discipline specific data literacy needs. Take it away, Megan. Wow, sorry, the mute button ran away. Thank you so much, Denise. Okay, so next slide. So, okay. I'm Megan Carlton. Uh, my contact information is on here, but today I'm going to talk about a program, um, an event that I did actually around the community that I live in. Um, <clears throat> so over, overall, we planned and executed a survey of biodiversity um, that's around Richardson Lake, uh, just a community lake in a neighborhood just south of Greensboro in Asheboro, North Carolina. So our age range for this uh, program was 13 and up, um, but we did actually have uh, some of the younger crowd come, but for the um, application that we used, they need to be 13 in order to use the program. Um, so um, the kids that were younger actually had their parents with them, helping them kind of use this program and things. Um, and our target audience for this one was actually just the community around the lake in Asheboro. And so I will give you a little bit of background um, so you kind of understand what we were trying to do. Okay, so the new development neighborhood that I moved to in fall of 2019 boasts an impressive number of birds, turtles, salamanders, beavers, and other animals, all supported by this hundred year old lake in, in our community, and it's known as Richardson Lake. Um, so as our neighborhood grew, we soon found out that the developer has plans to drain the lake before the neighborhood is complete. Um, so this really ignited the residents to want to take action. So we learned that the lake actually feeds two streams in the area that have been listed on the federal list of impaired waters for several decades due to their inability to adequately support aquatic life, and they're now federally protected. So the city actually has a watershed action plan regarding the stream um, that the lake feeds. And when we reached out to the agency that created that um, watershed plan, the, it's the Piedmont Triad Regional Council and their Stormwater Smart Program. They were really excited to work with us to see what they could do in regards to keeping the lake from being drained and to kind of see what the biodiversity in that lake was. So let's see. So since there was already a lot of life in the lake that, um, that we had seen, they really wanted to get out there and see um, at a microscopic le level what might be living in the lake. So we chose this project uh, because the goals align with both the community and the research interest of the North Carolina Department of Water Quality uh, to determine if that lake is vital to the health of the streams um, that it feeds and thus protecting the lake from being drained. Um, the PTRC, the Piedmont Tri Triad Regional Council's Stormwater Smart Program uses a combination of direct education and mass media to teach children and adults of all ages about stormwater runoff, um, best management practices, habitat, and wildlife. So their overall goal is to raise public awareness about water quality issues and increase local stewardship. So, and of course, the goal of the community was to protect the lake, um, not only for our home values and just for uh, recreational purposes, but also for that biodiversity that the lake supports. So to do this and to kind of um, get everybody really involved, we 
chose a citizen science project um, to kind of get everybody together and kind of try to make an impact to really um, change policy around that lake. So citizen science um, is technically it's scientific work undertaken by members of the general public in collaboration with or under the direction of professional scientists and scientific institutions. But more simply, it's just public participation in scientific research. So a lot of people kind of misunderstand this and think that citizen science is only about science, um, when it can really include a lot of different scientific aspects as far as, you know, researching art history, researching, um, <laughs> word, uh, researching, um, uh, you know, medical, aspects, things like that. It, it can include a whole lot more than just biodiversity. It can really be anything that you are interested in. There is probably a citizen science project out there for you to get involved in to really make a bigger impact. So specifically for this project, we wanted to do a bio blitz. So a bio blitz or a biothon is an intense period of biological surveying in an attempt to record all the living species within a designated area. Um, so groups of scientists, naturalists, and volunteers kind of conduct an intensive field study over a continuous time period. So bio blitzes are a great, great way to engage the public and to connect, con to connect them to their environment um, while generating useful data for science and conservation. So for any type of bio blitz, I mean, not all of these are required, but they're all very helpful. Um, the big thing that helped us with our project um, was really the partnerships that we made. So again, they're not required. You can do these on your own, um, but it's been very, very helpful to work with um, the Stormwater Smart Program. So you can try to reach out to different partners like local environmental agencies, um, education centers such as zoos, science centers, um, and uh, local interest groups. So uh, if you have a local birding group or something like that, they can really help you like get that base of volunteers and um, bring their knowledge into, into that group. Um, so you also need uh, to market your project. So get people excited about coming and joining. Um, and you can give this information to them by creating a project page on um, the platform iNaturalist, which is one that, that I use a lot. Um, there's also other, um, other sites like SciStarter.org and you can add your event to them, uh, to their page or even on Evenbrite, you can add your event to there and also the Facebook events page just to kind of get it out there. Um, and then for, for this specific project or for bio blitzes, you really need a knowledge of iNaturalist. Um, so this program is really simple to use and it kind of helps, helps you take a snapshot of the biodiversity that you've seen in your area. So the time commitment for this one, um, before the event, there was, a couple of meetings that I had with um, with the Stormwater Smart program coordinators. Um, so I think we only had like two one hour meetings and I talk a lot, so it probably wasn't all planning. Um, and then just creating marketing material for our community and some educational material um, to get around to the community to try to get them to understand kind of what was going on, what was the purpose of this project, and then how to use that iNaturalist program. Um, the day of the event, we had about an hour for setup, you know, to find a good place where we could get down to the water, um, which I'll go more into in a minute. Um, and then during the actual event, we, we had set aside four hours um, to actually 
get in the water, take samples, try to see what we could find. And then afterwards we had prizes for the kids, um, t-shirts, things like that, that again, having that partnership was great because it cost us nothing to do. Um, all of these prizes and educational material were actually given to us by the Stormwater SMART program. So the actual event. Um, so um, this is, uh, over on the right is kind of a screenshot of all the um, observations that we had the day of, um, just around the lake. It, could, it was birds, turtles, all of that good stuff. But the most important thing that we were really looking for um, were these things on the left that look kind of gross, but um, these kind of macro invertebrates, they're just small aquatic bugs that are often used to evaluate uh, water quality conditions um, because they're not as mobile as fish and can't really move to avoid pollution they are an indicator of water quality. So having a lot of these different species in the water means that that, you know, is kind of supporting the whole food chain in the lake from the bottom up. So a lot of these were um, dragonfly larvae and damselfly larvae and some nematodes and some other creepy crawlies, which the kids absolutely love to get their hands on. Um, so, yeah, so while, while we were out there and we were finding all of these little critters and things in the lake, um, the uh, representative that came out from Stormwater Smart actually took that time to educate um, the kids in the area about where our stormwater drains are, you know, flowing directly into the lake um, and aren't really filtered like people normally think they are, and even the adults in the area um, or in the community, they're like, you know, you shouldn't really wash your car, things like that, because it's all going directly into the lake. Um, so it was a great educational opportunity um, for just stormwater health and good habits in general, um, but also, you know, for the biodiversity in the area. So the lessons that we learned from this was, although we didn't have a huge turnout, um, which I was a little disappointed about at first because we have about 97 families in our neighborhood um, and we only had about five families show up. So there were about 20 of us out there, but that actually having that small turnout really increased our engagement individually. Um, so, you know, we were able to answer specific questions easily and really, you know, get into depth about the importance of all these things with the lake. Um, and then, so the things that I could have done better, and now I know, is to really, you really need to take the time to educate um, your community about what a BioBlitz is. I mean, I thought that I was doing this and apparently I was not because people were really confused about what we were actually gonna be doing. Um, and then also have activities outside of getting dirty was really important. We had people that did not really like the outdoors so they wanted a separate activity to do um, other than you know getting, getting in the water um, and looking for little bugs. So we do actually have some ideas on what we can have those people doing um, in our next bio blitz. So we have a second one uh, set for September during Creek Week. Um, and for this one, we are going to make it a lot bigger. This one was, uh, the first one that we did was more of a preliminary event to see what all we would need um, next time. So next time they're gonna bring a boat and things like that so we can really get out into the water and see what's out there. Um, and we're also going to have representatives from uh, the North Carolina Zoo come and the Wildlife Commission to help us identify some of the other animals that we find. Um, so I know this is a very specific project, but bio blitzes and many citizen science projects, they can be they can be anything that you want. It doesn't have to be so specific as to helping a small community lake, but this is also something that, um, if your community is concerned about something environmental in your area, this could be a good place to go. 
And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Megan, for sharing with us about the BioBlitz. Next up, we'll have Rudyette Yisak. Rudyette is a youth services librarian at the Central Library in Forsyth County Public Library. Rudyette has worked as a youth services librarian in Forsyth County Public Library for four years. Rudyette provides a variety of programs from birth to 11 years old, ranging from storylines, craft demonstrations, and STEAM activities. Rudyette graduated from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill with a bachelor's degree in English and history. Rudyette, also known as Rudy, organized her master's degree from North Carolina Central University with a public and digital libraries concentration. Go ahead and take it over, Rudy. Hello, my name is Rudy. I am currently trying to share my screen. So apologize for the delay. <laughs> um, let's see. I hope you all can see that. And let me go ahead and start the presentation. So um, I work at a public library. Um, I do to-go kits um, and I'll, that's what we'll be talking about first. And uh, also we've had a recent partnership with Eco Explore, which I explain a little bit about what that is. And through Eco Explore, we've been able to have discovery packs um, being offered to people to check out. So to-go kits, if you haven't heard about this, it's pretty recent that um, public libraries have been starting to do since uh, COVID had started. Um, we initially started this uh, in the fall when our library became open to the public. Um, we offer it on a weekly basis and we separate it for kids who are ages two through five, and then the older kids would be six through 11. And this is through the children's department at my branch. Um, each week we'll have a different set of weekly crafts that um, cater to each age group and demographic. Um, one thing that's the main difference between the younger kid uh, to-go kits and the older kid to-go kits is how complex the activity is. So with the uh, younger kids, we don't, um, we don't have as many uh, at home supplies that are required. So if they needed to use scissors, their things are pre-cut. Um, they don't necessarily have to use glue or tape. Sometimes they do, but pretty much the, all the materials are inside um, the to-go kit. Um, the older kits so it requires a little bit more supervision. Um, they'll be using scissors, glue, tape, sometimes a stapler depending on the activity. And um, those are encouraged, uh, those who are older are encouraged to uh, do this activity with a little bit more guidance through the instructions um, that we provide for the older kids. We don't necessarily provide them for the younger ones since the activity is usually going to be a little bit more simple. And so these on the left are examples of some of the crafts that we've done. Um, I picked a lot of them for um, the basically were animal based. Um, so that kind of relates to steam. Um, the most of the kit, most of the kits are paper based um, so that, you know, if by any chance they're done with their activity or they mess up, they can be recycled very easily. Um, we started using paper bags, which again can be recyclable. Um, and then we have a, a weekly craft demonstration that is virtual through Zoom um, to the older kids, which is the more complex activity. So in going up about evaluating how the craft kits have been successful or not, um, the, mo the one thing that I noticed is that the more complex the activity or the project is, the less likely people will be taking it from the library, um, which makes sense because if you're struggling, if the adult is struggling to complete the craft, then most likely the child will not be able to complete it as well. Um, or uh, so with that, <clears throat> um, another thing that I've noticed 
was um, it took a while for the to go kids to gain traction. So um, it didn't initially become as popular, but now that it's been mm, more than six months that we've done this project um, and have more publicity through flyers, website postings, and especially through social media, um, we've had a lot of um, popularity between kids who are, um, especially with the younger kids, because um, we do have programs like preschool story time, but for the middle, um, for those who are in elementary school, there's not a lot of activities that are provided. So this means to um, fill in the gaps with the older kids. Um, the cost of everything is usually pretty inexpensive. Normally, it would probably cost maybe 10 at the most $20 um, for the monthly craft kits. And usually we just buy in bulk so that we don't have to purchase as much materials each week. Um, and then the goal is to have STEAM pro projects, um, activity kits to be done during the summer when we have a lot more people attending, uh, virtually attending programs. Um, so hopefully with the popularity of the crafts that are tend to be more on the artsy side, more than STEAM or STEM, um, that it would be able to be popular. So some tips that I've um, come to notice and hope that if you decide to do this, um, you might be encouraged to do so, is that you should know your target audience and make sure you adapt your project to fit that audience. So for example, if you decide to make something with that's origami, so making a paper crane, for example, might be a little bit more complex for the younger kids. Um, so you try to figure out who you're trying to target first off before you start making plans for the crafter activity. Um, one thing that you should do is make sure you only make a certain amount of kits per week or per month, whichever one you feel more comfortable doing, and don't exceed it. You're not going to have enough materials to do um, like 50 for a week, um, unless it's that popular and you decide to do 50, increase it 50, but don't go starting making a whole bunch of kits um, initially, start off small. And then if you think that you would um, be able to uh, acquire as many materials for each kit, then increase it, just not initially. Um, and one thing you should be doing is you need to select some projects that don't require too much um, at home supplies. So if you require like 10 different things that you would find at home, it's probably not gonna be as successful as if you just need scissors and glue for an activity. And make sure you provide clear instructions so that the target audience would be able to do that with little or no um, parent uh, being able to overtake the task or craft activity. Um, and then one thing that does help is make sure that you have a model for your activity that's finished so they can at least look at it and see, oh, this is the, the craft that's, that's what the craft is supposed to be looking like. And um, one thing that helped was advertising it on social media so that those who are um, unable to pick up the kit, they can just look at that um, and then email me to see what materials you need so they can make it at home if they don't feel comfortable coming to the library. So Eco Explore is one of those um, programs that we uh, decided to apply for in the spring of last year. Um, it's an initiative through the North Carolina Arboretum. Eco Explore stands for Experiences Promoting Learning Outdoors for Research and Education. And it's an incentive-based citizen science program, which Megan described a little bit um, in her, or she described a lot, um, and I'm thankful for that about citizen science. So I won't go too much into detail about what that is. Um, but this is a target audience would be for children K through eight. Um, so how does an organization become a lone spot or a hotspot? They can apply on the Eco Explorer dot net website. And if you do the backslash about, you get to the Google form application. Um, the goal with Eco Explorer is to have um, all the counties represented in North Carolina. 
So each um, location that is a lung spot would be ones where uh, people can check out a discovery pack, which I'll explain in just a bit. And a hot spot is where they can observe wildlife. So how do the kids participate? They can sign up on ecoexplore.net. Um, and when they are able to either get a discovery pack or find materials at home to discover nature, they just submit a picture of what they see onto the ecoexplore.net. And then sometimes whenever they've been approved or um, verified, their observations can be submitted to the iNaturalist network. And that way scientists throughout the community would be able to um, use that information for their projects. And so what a discovery pack looks like is on the right. Um, and we'd be, um, backpacks basically filled with gear that you'd be using to um, observe nature, observe um, creatures in, uh, um, in nature. So what we have in Central is three backpacks that are filled with a critter cam, butterfly net, bird call. Um, this one's one that you twist uh, from the Audubon Society instead of you blow into the whistle, which would be hard to manage with everything going on with COVID. Um, binoculars and a bug binocular. Um, so these ones have been very popular. Uh, they've pretty much been checked out almost since the beginning of when these uh, backpacks have come to in existence at our location. Um, uh, though we've had a little bit of a hiccup with some of the um, items that were found in the kits, um, for the most part, people are taking good care of what's inside the, um, the pack. And one thing I was gonna show you is what the Eco Explorer, um, sorry, the Eco Explorer website looks like. So um, if you can see that, hopefully, um, you would see that the children could see it in nature. So this kid has um, uh, a newt, I believe, and they would uh, take the picture and then eventually share it onto the website and they would um, be able to earn prizes. Um, each season there are um, opportunities for them to earn badges um, so they could attend a virtual program um, where they gain information about, for example, it's um, the previous season was botany um, and they would um, to concentrate on finding um, things in nature that related to plants. Um, so when you go to the events page, you find upcoming events throughout um, each region, uh, prizes, they can earn all kinds of prizes um, depending on how many points they get. Uh, and then when you go to about, you can see, sorry, you can see what information is um, available about Eco Explorer and then how to apply for uh, uh, to be a lone spot or a hot spot through Eco Explorer. And I just have my email address on here if you ever wanted to get any more questions um, or are curious about the to go kits. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Rudy, for sharing with us about what the library does with the youth department. Next up, we'll have Joe Klein. Joe Klein is the GIS and data visualization librarian at UNC Greensboro. Joe works, works to advance how we teach data visualization in libraries and is part of an expanding network of data libraries and information professionals through their work as a Visualizing the Future Symposium Fellow and Planning Committee member for the 2020 and 2021 Southeast Data Librarian Symposium. Joe holds an MLIS degree from UNCG and a BS in biology from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and work with the US EPA conducting GIS and antibody assay analysis before becoming a librarian. They love the outdoors and can usually be found gardening, geocaching, or looking for birds and bugs in their free time. It's your turn, Joe. 
Thank you. And I also cannot read my entire uh, bio. There's too many L's in it. <laughs> so um, I am Joe. I use they, them pronouns. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a geocaching lunch and learn and some other geocaching programming that I have planned for the fall and future semesters because I do work at UNC Greensboro along with Megan. So um, a lot of what I do is based on the semester kind of schedule. Um, and I'm also gonna talk a little bit about the data visualization and science communication um, in-class sessions that I've done, which I think would be scalable to more public workshops or community workshops too, um, but I will get to that. So hopefully you all can see my screen and I'm going to make sure I can see people in my little window there in case I get my one minute timer. Okay, there we go. So first up is geocaching at UNCG. So I did earlier this week, actually, a lunch and learn webinar, which was just a 30 minute webinar to um, introduce any participants or attendees or folks who watch the recording to GPS or global positioning system, maybe satellite navigation and data collection, data logging and GIS mapping um, through geocaching. So geocaching is a uh, worldwide scavenger hunt slash um, treasure hunt using GPS devices. So things like your phone with like Google Maps, Apple Maps, or using an actual GPS handheld, which I have one if you can see this and I will drag my camera down into the shared screen for the recording. Um, so this uses the GPS system or satellite system to help folks navigate. So Geocaching is when you hide a container or an object or something anywhere, you log its coordinates on the geocaching.com website or in any of the other geocaching forums, and then folks can take those coordinates, put them into their phones and GPS handhelds, and then go and find these cool containers. Um, some of them have prizes or challenges and cool stuff to do in there too. Um, as I mentioned, my lunch and learn goal, I wanted to introduce people to both how to practice GPS navigation. So how to practice, you know, navigating around the woods or through the field um, or in urban areas. So I use GPS to get to, you know, one side of Greensboro from the other side of Greensboro, because I am directionally challenged, um, as well as data collection. So how do we collect the coordinates where we are at currently? How do we collect and navigate to coordinates of a geocache or a specific item, as well as data logging? So for geocaching, you usually have to log what day you found it your username on the geocaching website. And for some geocaches that have different challenges, you can log anywhere from like the birds that you saw on the way to the geocache, maybe um, the solution to a puzzle. And you have to get good at logging data when it's rainy, when it's super hot and humid out. Um, and this is stuff that a lot of scientists that work in the field have to deal with. So I like to kind of plug it as practice for that. Um, and then finally, GIS mapping. So um, GIS meaning geographic information systems, basically virtual digital maps. So you take these coordinates of geocaches, maybe it's geocaches that you've found in the past year or the past few weeks, and then you map them online and you can show people, oh, I went to this, this, and this one. You can see they're all within 10 meters of my house um, or something like that. So it's a really versatile, you can use it for a lot of different things um, to teach in GIS related um, STEM education. So future events. Um, that I would like to do include a geocaching challenge, which is inspired by the University of, I think it's Regina, I prefer to say Regina, um, but they're, they've got a geocaching challenge that has, um, I think it's students can go out and find, it's whoever finds the most geocaches or the um, most unique geocaches, they have a lot of different sub challenges within there, um, will win a prize. Um, I think you can win like a university t-shirt, a couple of other prizes if you um, take a picture of yourself with the geocache and put it in their form. So I really want to do something like that at UNCG for any UNCG student or community members as well. So our Lunch and Learn was open to community members in addition to UNCG faculty, staff, and students, because um, I want to see if I can get the community involved in this too, because it's really for everybody. Um, another thing I want to try is a create a cache activity where you not only go out and find geocaches, but you get your container, which could be a Tupperware container, it could be a, a coffee tin, any container, or you know, sometimes people use those little pill um, travel cases um, where you take a container, you take a bunch of cool knickknacks and stuff to put in them, and then we'll go out and place these in geocaches and then log their locations on the geocaching.com website. 
so that folks who attend that you know workshop or activity which could be done asynchronously um, can say that they've created a geocache and they've got one floating out there and then another thing i want to try is a virtual mapping or gis workshop integrated with um, in fall 2021 every fall there is a gis day so GIS Day is hosted, I think, by ESRI, which is kind of the leading um, GIS, Earth and Environment, geolocation um, company. So they uh, have ArcGIS for folks that have heard of a lot of GIS tools or some GIS tools. Um, but they have a GIS Day to get anybody who wants to get involved with GIS, who doesn't know what it is, um, who, yeah, doesn't know what it is, um, to learn what it is and how they can get involved and use it. So the Lunch and Learn, um, I already kind of mentioned the target audience was um, college students, specifically of UNCG or the surrounding um, colleges and universities as well, um, as well as our staff, faculty, and then any community members um, in the surrounding areas or you know maybe alumni who have graduated and moved elsewhere um, because geocaching is an international game. It happens everywhere, it's so cool. So I hope to continue with that age range or target audience through future workshops too. Um, but really, it could be scaled up or down or to any audience, depending on where you're doing, if you would like to do similar geocaching programming. So you could easily scale it to um, public libraries for kids. So a lot of kids will go geocaching with their parents. And that's actually how I got into it. Um, so it's a really kind of versatile activity. And I have a lot of words on this slide. It's not as pretty as Megan and Rudy's, <laughs> but um, so some resources needed. Um, thinking about the lunch and learn, which I did do earlier this week and have been planning, and then the geocaching challenge, which I've done some planning for, but have not actually done yet. So that's more thinking ahead to what I anticipate we'll need for it. Um, so for the lunch and learn, you need Zoom, YouTube, some other video conferencing tool. So you don't actually need Zoom or um, I think WebEx or any of those tools. You could just start a YouTube live stream um, and folks can put in questions um, as they would like into YouTube or a form or some other way if they have questions. Um, the geocaching challenge, oops, sorry, I'm skipping steps. You might need a webcam and a mic too in order to present, but you don't need a webcam, just a mic. Uh, for the geocaching challenge, you would need, participants would need some sort of mobile device and or GPS handheld. So most folks that would be participating in that, participating in that might have a phone already, but some might not. Um, so that might be something where you could look into your library hosting a tech checkout or loan for the period of that geocaching challenge where you might get a couple of cheaper um, GPS units from, um, there's a couple of like, I think $30 ones that I've seen floating around, um, although the majority of them are a little bit pricier. Um, or you can just use your cell phone. So having a, a cell phone or a tablet on hand to check out to folks who need it for the challenge. Um, prizes are... Uh, helpful to get folks involved. So things like geocoins, which are cool little um, printed enamel coins or pins, or they could be, be something as simple as like small Rubik's cubes, which I see a lot in geocaches or marbles. Kids love getting marbles and tiny, you know, knickknacks from Michael's or a craft store in there too. And you could even put like a small craft kit, which might be a cool, like for bigger caches, I might look into doing that. Um, you would need a website or a landing page. And this could be as simple as just a, a page on your universities um, or on your public library or other libraries kind of website. Um, or it could be a separate Google site with a whole, you know, different tabs and everything about geocaching and what this different information is. Um, and then you need a free geocaching.com account. So this one I have an asterisk by because you don't technically need one. If you're doing workshops that are being led by somebody with an account, um, or you can have folks pair up with COVID, this is a little bit you know, difficult to do, um, but you can also do asynchronous ones where you can pick a few geocaches for folks, print those out, and then have like a piece of paper with the geocache readily available. Um, folks won't be able to log it if they don't have the geocaching.com account to say that, hey, I found this, this is my username, but they can at least find it and join the fun that way for your challenge. And then for the create a cache, it's gonna be a lot of the same thing, mobile devices, GPS handhelds, um, you would probably need to con uh, provide containers too. So I have a lot of like small, like Cool Whip and sugar containers that you can easily gather up. And this could be a cool like recycling activity too. So go around a neighborhood, see what containers folks have hoarded up and can I make that into a geocache? Um, as far as time commitment, the lunch and learn, 
um, is a 30 minute webinar. I chose to do 30 minutes just because folks don't have a lot of attention span, especially now um, that we've started the summer semester for our students, but um, it is a really good summer activity. So I wanted to do something that wasn't gonna create a, a long time commitment. And then I, in addition to making it a 30 minute live webinar, we recorded it so that folks can go back at any time and watch this, learn about geocaching and then go do their thing. Um, and I'm continuously doing outreach and materials for that too. So instead of just recording it one and done, I'm going to be um, doing a more regular, like, did you know this webinar, this Lunch and Learn is available for you to learn about geocaching? And I'm hoping that helps get more participation. So we did get, um, I believe three people attending the Lunch and Learn, and I've seen already a couple of folks have watched it on YouTube. So I think that's five total now. So hopefully we'll see more people join in that um, throughout the summer. Um, the time commitment for the Lunch and Learn also involves setting up. So registration and outreach. I wanted to see what folks were um, signing up for the Lunch and Learn, what folks were interested in it. So I had a Google form at one point just to get a feel for if it was community members, if it was UNCG folks, um, like student staff and faculty um, who was signing up for this and interested in it. So I can better target like a geocaching challenge too in the future. And then preparing slides and recording. I had an asterisk there that disappeared mysteriously but I've prepared slides, which I'm willing to share too. So on the previous slide, I had a link to it and I can share that as well. So you're also welcome to use those instead of you know, spending hours preparing your own. Um, and that's just a basic, what is geocaching? How does it work? And then for the geocaching challenge, it's a lot more versatile because it's an asynchronous event. You don't have to do it all at once at the same time, although you could do you know, like geocaching walks where you go out at the same time. Um, so that could take anywhere. I think it's recommended that you choose one week or so to do that, um, to get people to give people time to really find these geocaches and contribute. Um, and then as far as setting up registration and outreach, preparing a web page or tech checkout, that might take a little bit longer depending on your specific library and situation. Um, some lessons learned, and which I kind of went into thinking about, especially for the lunch and learn. So burnout and Zoom fatigue is real especially now as we're entering summer um, folks are some folks are eager to get started with summer programming and you know what's some cool stuff I can do with my kids um, some folks are you know done for a week they want to just do nothing which is where I'm at um, just want to veg in front of the TV so a lot of that was not expecting cameras to be on especially for um, the lunch and learn so I didn't really want it to be too interactive for the 30 minute lunch and learn because I would have interactive things later on so it's a it's a thing that folks can just you know set up as they're making lunch or eating lunch and just watch it um, bring a co-presenter so to anticipate folks not wanting to really get engaged or interactive because that's something I run into a lot with my webinars is you know folks just have their camera off and they're just there to watch while they eat and they don't really want to get involved that much so I had Megan with me to kind of field questions and we did get a couple of questions and some interaction at the end, which was nice. Um, but having a co-presenter to really ask questions and you know, be your, your in man in the crowd was helpful. Um, and then having an option for asynchronous participation is helpful as well for those who um, can't make it or you know, at the last minute or like, I don't have the energy for this, they can always watch it later. So continuously reminding folks that this video is out there for them um, helps with that too. And then outreach, so using social media and networks. Um, so we used, um, I used the uh, university social media, our library social media to get word out about this. I shared it through Twitter because I have a lot of folks who are interested in this type of stuff on Twitter um, versus just, you know, putting a flyer on a table and calling it done. Um, I wanted to get more of a virtual presence. Um, invitation to register for recording or asynchronous participation helped. Um, because then I could get a better feel for if folks were actually going to attend the recording or whether they just, or the live session, or whether they just wanted the recording, um, which is okay. And then it gives me uh, an opportunity to tailor it based on who will be showing up. And then considering device requirements and alternatives, which is really important for geocaching because you may need your phone or your GPS handheld. So some geocaches you don't need, you can just find them on Google Maps and it's pretty obvious where they are. Like some of them are in the middle of, um, uh, parking lots and you can like, okay, I think I know where that is. Um, but if folks don't have a phone, um, it might be worth advertising your tech checkout or, or loaning on a flyer or any outreach as well. So that's geocaching. Um, I'm going to go by this one a little bit quick because I only have one minute. So these were class sessions I did on data literacy topics, which Megan helped me set up. 
um, or set up because Megan was very embedded in this class. So I, it was done for a class at UNCG, but could easily be turned into a longer workshop series or, um, or just a day long, maybe two hours, one hour long workshop um, on how to communicate science with data visualization. So it involved a lot of interactive GM boards, so sticky notes of what questions and topics interest you. Um, students found a data set, and then we used Data Wrapper, which is a tool that has data viz tools to create data visualizations using either their data sets or just a sample. So it kind of gave students a, a very broad primer on how to find data, how to evaluate it, and then how to create visualizations and charts with it. Um, so maybe a little bit more for the older kids or first students. Um, but this could totally be, I think, tailored to um, younger students with, again, craft kits. I love that idea so much, Rudy, um, where you can do a data visualization craft kit or something like that. Um, so how do folks, I think they're called data sculptures. So you could get like little um, pipe cleaners and, and different craft materials and how folks create something that they think fits the data, which is another way to connect them to that. Um, and again, this was for older students. I'm not gonna go super into these because um, I am out of time, but thank you. <laughs> And there was, just for everyone's information, there was another question in the chat with, to Joe um, in terms of if Data Wrapper was free or subscription based. Um, and Joe was very quick to reply, thank you, Joe, um, that it's free. Um, there are purchasing and subscription options, but the free version um, actually suffices. Um, and Joe did provide the link to Data Wrapper um, in the in chat and also commented that um, it's used because it breaks down the data viz process into four steps. And I should add four steps that match kind of like a data literacy model. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if there are no further questions, I want to thank everyone for attending our STEM Link webinar, Engaging with STEM During COVID. We will have the recording available, um, if not later this week, then at the beginning of next week. And we'll email that to everyone who registered for the webinar, as well as provide the video on our YouTube channel. Um, I hope everyone has a great and fantastic Thursday.